Now, welcome back. Let's continue our overview of the various types of descriptions and how they are used. Here we have a meets and bounds description which gives all of the dimensions and angular relationships of the sides. It might read like this. That portion of lot two, block B, tract 1124, in the city of, county of, state of California, according to map recorded in book 100, pages 16 and 17 of maps, in the office of the county recorder of said county, described as follows. <clears throat> Beginning at the southwest corner of said lot two, thence along the west line of said lot two, a bearing and a distance. Thence, a bearing on a distance to the east line of said lot two. Thence, along said east line, a bearing on a distance to the southeast corner of said lot two. Thence, along the south line of said lot two, a bearing on a distance to the point of beginning. Note that the point of beginning is a record point that both the surveyor and the title person should be able to find. The basis of bearings is established along the west line of the lot. Remember that anything on that map may be used to locate that line. The free line call, the one that crosses the lot, is located by turning the deflection angle derived from comparing the bearings of the first two courses. Note again that if the description had given only a general direction along the west line of the lot, like northerly along the west line of said lot, and then a bearing for the free line call, the reader would not be able to get that deflection angle. The distance in the free line call would have to yield if necessary in order to reach the east line as stated in the description. Here again, the call was simply to the lot line and not to a specific point, such as a lot corner, or a point on the line a certain distance from one of the corners. The last two courses follow along the title lines where, whether the bearings and distances given fit or not. A strip description describes a grantor's property and then describes a strip of land that will cross the property. The description says that any portion of the, of the strip that falls on the grantor's property will be conveyed to the grantee. If the grant is an easement, that is what is conveyed. The strip is usually based on points and lines outside the subject property. It is not, necessarily, it is not necessary to know exactly where the grantor's property lines are. A description of the strip on lot three, as highlighted on the screen, might read like this. That portion of Lot 3, Block B, Tract 1124, in the city of, county of, state of California, according to map recorded in Book 100, pages 16 and 17 of maps, in the office of the county recorder of said county, included within a strip of land 20.00 feet wide, line 10.00 feet on each side of the following described line beginning at a point on the west line of said tract 1124, distant along said west line, bearing on a distance, from the southwest corner of said tract, thence bearing on a distance to a point on the east line of said tract 1124, distant along said east line, bearing on a distance from the southeast corner of said tract. Note that we said each side of the line and not either. Remember that the word either means one or the other, which is certainly not our intent. It is not necessary to add a clause stating that the side line should be prolonged or shortened so as to terminate at the lot lines because that portion of the entire strip that falls within the lot will convey. <clears throat> now the of descriptions. The word of is used because it is a vital ingredient in all the descriptions of this type. This type of description is designed to create a strip of land of fixed width along one border of a parcel. For instance, the southerly 10 feet of lot 2 is understood to create a strip of land 10 feet wide measured at right angles bounded on the south by the south line of the lot. 
the 10 feet might be measured along one of the lot lines instead of at right angles, in which case the description should so state. Of descriptions, sometimes use area instead of distance as control. For instance, a description reading, the south 2.00 acres of, applied to a four-sided parcel with each of the sides being close to a cardinal direction would be understood to set the north line of the two acres parallel with the south line of the parcel. When the shape of the parcel is irregular, however, this type is hard to interpret. Another form of, of description is the proportional type, such as the south half of lot two. The word half, again, means area. And again, the north line of the south half would be set parallel with the south line of the lot in cases where the lot lines are close to a cardinal direction. If they are not in nearly cardinal directions or if the parcel is irregular in shape, a description like this may be subject to more than one interpretation. A line description is one that takes all of a grantor's property, wherever it is, lying a certain direction from a described line which normally originates and ends outside the grantor's property. The advantage is that the free line calls can be located with precision, even though the grantor's property lines may not. The one we see highlighted might be described like this. That portion of lot three line northerly of the following described line. Then would follow a description of the line beginning on the track boundary on the west and ending on the track boundary on the east similar to the way we did in the strip description. This description would take any portion of lot three that fell northerly of that line, whether the lot lines could be located or not. This same described line can be used for each parcel that the line crosses. Only the lot number or other parcel identification would have to change. The same is true for strip descriptions. The exception method describes more property than is intended, and then the unneeded portion is accepted, which in effect subtracts it from the description. It has the advantage of making it possible to create new property lines in a secure fashion. This method works very well in the drawing now on the screen where the south line of the section is secure, but the east line is not. The body of the description can describe the highlighted portion, including the small remainder in the southeast corner of the section. Then that small remainder can be accepted out. The net result is what we now see on the screen. This technique makes it possible for each of the two sets of free line calls to be described individually, each one clearly based on the south line of the section. Neither is compromised in any way by the necessary call along the uncertain east line of the section. Now, the inclusive type of description. This technique is also used to create surveyable free line calls where the location of one or more tidal lines is uncertain. The preamble says, in effect, that portion of the owner's property such as the southeast quarter of section 11, included within the following described parcel. Then the new parcel is described deliberately extending it safely beyond the tidal line whose location is uncertain. This technique can be used even if all of the, uh, the grantor's property lines are uncertain as to location. The new parcel is deliberately designed to extend beyond or overlap all of the grantor's property lines that are affected. The new parcel itself, of course, is based on a line that is secure. The way to convey to the tidal line, wherever it may be, but at the same time, <clears throat> the effect is to convey to the tidal line wherever it may be. But at the same time, it creates new property lines, the free line calls that are surveyable and not compromised in any way 
by the location of the uncertain tidal line. This type of description is really a last resort technique, but there are occasions when it is appropriate. The bearings and distances listed in the body of the description would describe the parcel that extends beyond the property line, but the portion actually conveyed would end at the property line. The exception method can also be used in this case. The preamble would state that portion of the southeast quarter of section 11 described as follows. Then the overlapping parcel would be described as in the inclusive method. Following that, a statement would be added, accepting therefrom any portion lying within section 12. You need a plan before beginning to write. Here are some basic questions that must be answered before beginning the task of writing you are less likely to make errors if you systematically think your way through these questions before actually writing the description. They won't all apply in every case, but it is good to get in the habit of systematically considering each question to make sure nothing important is overlooked. Number one, what kind of description is best? Number two, what kind for the adjoining parcels? Number three, what point is best for the point of beginning? Number four, where should the basis of bearings be established? Number five, clockwise or counterclockwise? Number six, what calls should be made? Number seven, what clauses need to be added? Let's take a quick look at each of the seven questions to make sure that we understand them. Number one, what kind of description is best? We've illustrated a number of types of descriptions that can be used depending on the need. We've referred to them as tools in our toolbox. If one doesn't fit, perhaps another will. Number two, what kind for the adjoining parcels? When describing the right-of-way for, for facilities like utilities or roads, the requirements cross many property lines. The techniques you use for two adjoining parcels need to be compatible. If the descriptions for two adjoining parcels describe a common point on the property line in two different ways, you are likely to wind up with a sawtoothed right-of-way. Number three, what point is best for the point of beginning? Remember that the point of beginning must be a record point or reference to one, and there must be no doubt about its location. The basis of bearings is normally established in the course that follows and the free line calls immediately after that, if possible. Number four, where should the basis of bearings be established? Both ends of the line used for the basis of bearings should be secure and not just one. If the location of the entire description, the location of the entire description is dependent on the location of the basis of bearings. Remember that the free line calls should be made immediately after the basis of bearings if possible. Remember also that a bearing is a relative statement that has no meaning to the surveyor unless it can be related to a line in the field. Be sure to give a bearing for the line you have chosen for the basis of bearings and not just a general direction like easterly. Question number five, clockwise or counterclockwise? Some people are under the impression that meets and bounds descriptions must be written in a clockwise fashion. That is not true. In fact, clockwise is sometimes the wrong way to go. Remember that the free line calls need to be based securely on the best evidence which is normally the basis of bearings. Have you ever heard someone say that they took the LS exam and did pretty well, but they failed to establish the basis of bearings on a description writing problem? I have, and I've heard it a number of times. Number six, what calls should be made? 
Remember we said that one of the errors the average surveyor is most likely to make is the failure to make appropriate tidal calls. Here is your chance to correct that. Systematically go through the description with this very question in mind. That way you won't overlook an important call. Number seven, what clauses need to be added? There may be a need for an area clause, a special basis of variance clause, or a clause to clarify what happens to the sidelines of a strip of land. Don't take a chance on overlooking one that is needed. Now let's take a look at some sample descriptions and plan the task using the seven questions we've just introduced. What better place to get the sample questions than the LS exams from previous years? We'll study a number of them, beginning with the 1977 exam. You have copies of these problems as they appeared on the exams in your workbook. You will also find a copy of the planning the task list of questions there. You may want to stop the tape now and find them so you will have them before you as we go. You'll find it helpful because the drawings we show on the screen have been edited a bit. Ready? Okay, let's go. 1977 exam, problem C4. The drawing is described as a parcel of land identified as Track 1 of Man Subdivision per Map Book 3, page 17, records of such and such a county, California. We are further told that the bearings and distances not shown are not to be assumed or calculated and we are to disregard possible requirements for a parcel map. We are to write a meets and bounds description for each of the three parcels to be cut out of the tract. We can assume that all of the lot lines and corners are good, so we don't have to be concerned about pedigree of corners in this problem. Not all of the seven questions will apply here, but it is good practice to get in the habit of checking each one. We are required to write a meets and bounds description for each of the three, so question number one has been answered for us. Question two, what kind for the adjoining parcels, and number seven, what clauses need to be added, do not apply here and can be disregarded. The remaining four questions do apply, however, and need to be considered. Let's apply each of the four questions to each of the three parcels. Parcel A. A preamble is called for in this one. It would read like this. That portion of Track 1 of Man Subdivision, according to map recorded in Book 3, page 17 of maps in the official records of such and such a county, California, described as follows. Now, question number three. What point is best for the point of beginning? The point of beginning must be at or related to one of the track corners. It really could be any of the track corners, but the BC and EC of the curve, as well as the most northerly corner, would lead to some awkward wording. The south line of parcel A is tied to the southwest and southeast corners, so we'll have to refer to them anyway in order to set the south line of parcel A. Let's use one of them and describe it as follows. Beginning at a point on the northwesterly line of said track one, distant northeasterly along said line 510.00 feet from the southwesterly corner of said track. This sets the point of beginning at a point on the northwesterly line of the track reference to the southwest corner of the track, a record corner that will satisfy the surveyor, the title person, and the judge. Question number four, where should the basis of bearings be established? Actually, a basis of bearings in the conventional sense is not needed on this parcel because the south line of the parcel will be set between two fixed points, and all of the other courses will be along existing tidal lines. There are no bearings used except the general directions like northerly, northwesterly, etc. The normal place to begin a basis of bearings, to establish a basis of bearings, would be the northwest line of the track where a direction is given from the track corner to the point of beginning. 
Here again, if there were bearings on each of the straight lines on the track boundary and a calculated bearing on the south line of parcel A, it would be essential to give the bearing of the northwesterly line of the track and not just the general direction, northeasterly, so that the angle of intersection between the track line and the south line of parcel A can be determined. Number five, clockwise or counterclockwise. Either would work in this case, but it is good to get in the habit of describing free line calls first. So I would choose counterclockwise. Number six, what calls should be made? A call must be made to a specific point on the east line of the track, just as in describing the POB, and calls must be made along the track boundary wherever the description traversed it. A description might read like this after describing the POB. Thence easterly to a point on the east line of said tract, distant northerly along said east line, 350.00 feet from the southeast corner of said tract. Thence northerly along said east line to the most northerly corner of said tract. Thence westerly and southwesterly along the general northerly and northwesterly line of said tract to the point of beginning. Parcel B. Question number three. What point is best for the point of beginning? It would be natural to use the southwest corner of the track for the point of beginning, but when we think ahead to question number six, what calls to make, we will see an advantage to doing it a little differently. The only way we have of describing the curve forming the northeasterly line of the parcel is to describe it as passing through two specific points one on the northwesterly line of the track and the other on the southerly line. Let's describe the POB as beginning at a point on the southerly line of said track one, distant easterly, 300.00 feet along said southerly line from the southwest corner of said track one. Question four, where should the basis of bearings be established? Again, this is not needed because the one free line is tied to two fixed points. The normal place for the basis of bearings, however, would be the south line of the track. Question five, clockwise or counterclockwise? Since we have already begun on the south line of the track, we will have to go clockwise in order to set the point on the northwesterly line of the track. If we had begun at that point on the northwesterly line of the track, we would have had to go counterclockwise. Number six, what calls should be made? The two points through which the curve passes must be specifically described in one way or another. Also, calls must be made along the two track lines and the track corner must be called because the curve passes through points that are tied to the corner. The portion of the description that follows the point of beginning might read like this. Thence westerly along said southerly line, 300.00 feet to the southwest corner of said track one. Thence northeasterly along the northwesterly line of said track one, 350.00 feet to a non-tangent curve, concave southwesterly having a radius of 500.00 feet. Said curve also passing through the point of beginning. Thence, southeasterly along said curve to the point of beginning. Parcel C, beginning with question number three again. What point is best for the point of beginning? Here again, we'll have to be a bit creative as we were in parcel B. The only controls we have here are the four distances, the location of the track corner and the two track lines. There is no direction given for the two sides with lengths of 147 feet and 210 feet. So the distances themselves will have to control. In order to do that, we will have to tie those two sides to fixed points on the two track lines. 
Let's begin at the southwest corner of Parcel C. It may sound like this. Beginning at a point on the south line of said tract one, distant westerly along said south line, 200.00 feet from the southeast corner of said tract. Number four, where should the basis of bearings be established? Same answer is in parcel B. No bearings are used, so none is needed. Number five, clockwise or counterclockwise? Our point of beginning has set one of the control points, which will control the location of the northerly and westerly sides, <clears throat> but we must set the other one before those two sides can be described. We'll have to go counterclockwise in this case. Note that if we had placed the point of beginning on the east line of the tract, we would have had to go clockwise. Number six, what calls should be made? The tract corner and the two tract lines. Again, the two specific points on the tract lines need to be described in one way or another. The portion of the description following the point of beginning might read like this. Thence easterly along said south line of said tract, 200.00 feet to the southeast corner of said tract. Thence northerly along the east line of said tract, 150.00 feet. Thence westerly, 210.00 feet to a point that is distant 147.00 feet from the point of beginning. Thence southerly, 147.00 feet to the point of beginning. 1978 exam, problem C1. We're asked to calculate dimensions and write a legal description for that portion of the south half of the southeast quarter of the southeast quarter of section 22, lying east of Pratt Road. Dimensions are given to and along the center line of the road. So dimensions to and along the east line of the road will have to be calculated. I'll leave that part to you. But we can plan the task by asking our questions of the parcel before we start to write. Number one, what kind of parcel of a description is best? The problem calls for a meets and bounds description. A line description would be tempting otherwise. It would read, that portion of the south half of the southeast quarter of the southeast quarter of section 22 lying east of Pratt Road, as described in deed, etc. <coughs> Question two, what kind for the adjoining parcels? To truly locate the subject parcel, we would have to properly break down the section, which would require more than the one monument shown. We must assume, for the purposes of this problem, that the dimensions and bearings of the sides of this parcel are correct as shown. If there were some question as to the true location of the north line of the subject parcel, then, when writing a description for the parcel just north of ours, we would have to be careful so that we would not end up with two locations for the intersection of the east line of the road and the north line of the subject parcel. Number three, what point is best for the point of beginning? <clears throat> As we've just stated, the true location of the north line of the south half of the southeast quarter of the southeast quarter of any section is dependent on the section breakdown, which in turn is dependent on several monuments. A line like that is not normally a good place to start a description. The section corner is the obvious place to begin. Number four, where should the basis of bearings be established? The south line of the section looks good because then we can describe the side line of the road immediately after establishing the basis of bearings. Remember that in order to establish a basis of bearings, we will have to say along the south line of said section and also give the bearing of the line south 89 degrees 32 minutes west. Just calling along the section line, even with a general direction, is not enough. Number five, clockwise or counterclockwise? It really would not matter, since every course in this description will be along an existing tidal line. 
In other words, there are no free line calls that need to be based clearly on the basis of bearings. An old habit, however, would lead me to go clockwise so that the new property line, the east line of the existing Pratt Road, could be described immediately after the basis of bearings. Number six, what calls should be made? <clears throat> the section corner would have to be described, of course. The monument could be described if desired, but it is not necessary. A call for a physical monument is a double call and usually results in more trouble than it is worth. The first call, first course, would have to call along the section line and to the east line of the road, as described in the deed that created it. The next three courses would have to call along the east line of that road, and the last of those three courses would have to call to the north line of the south half of the southeast quarter of the southeast quarter of the section, which is the property line. The following course would have to call along that north line to the east line of the section. The last course would have to call along said east line of the section to the point of beginning. All of the distances and all of the bearings except the one in the south line of the section would have to yield if necessary because of these tidal calls. Number seven, what clauses need to be added? The problem states that area is not required and there doesn't appear to be a need for any others. Now the 1984 exam, problem D5. We're asked here to write a description for a 20 acre parcel in the northeast quarter of section 11. The drawing indicates that no monument was found for the northwest corner of the section, but the other section corner monuments and all of the quarter corner monuments were found. Note that the only monuments needed to break out the northeast quarter of the section are the four quarter corner monuments and the one at the northeast corner of the section. The dimensions also indicate that it is a conveniently square standard section so we can conclude that normal federal breakdown procedures can be followed. The description would read, the west half of the northwest quarter of the northeast quarter of section 11, township 10 south, range 2 west, Mount Diablo Meridian, in the county of Santa Cruz, state of California, as shown on the official plat thereof, on file in the office of the Bureau of Land Management. There should be an approval date for the official plat, but none is given. 1984 exam, problem D6. Here we have four situations where our list of questions really do not apply. These are the kinds we refer to as of descriptions because that word is always a key ingredient. There are some important rules and principles to learn, however. So let's take a look at the drawings one at a time and learn what to look for and what techniques work. Number one, our first drawing is a parallelogram to be divided in half by area. The west half is to be conveyed first and the east half later. The real challenge here is how to describe the dividing line in such a way that each of the two descriptions would place it in the same location. Remember that there is no fixed rule in state law that dictates, for instance, where the east line of the west half should be placed. It must result in dividing the parcel in half by area, but that's all the law requires. Good surveying practice recommends certain procedures depending on the nature of the parcel. Note that the left and right side lines are not parallel. That could lead to some confusion as to where to place the dividing line if a simple description, the west one half of lot seven, were used. Some would make the dividing line parallel with the west line of the lot, but others would use a mean of the bearings for the west and east lines of the lot. Therefore, it is important to specify exactly how to set that dividing line and use the same language in each of the two descriptions. We might say this for the first parcel conveyed. The west one half of lot seven, the east line being parallel with the west line of said lot. 
The second parcel conveyed then would read like this. The east one half of lot seven. The west line of said east one half being parallel with the west line of said lot. Number two, the first description. The north 75.00 feet of lot 10 of, etc., would do the job. That language would result in the south line being parallel with the north line of the lot. Second description. The north line of this piece is not parallel with the south line of the lot because the east and west lines of the piece are both 75 feet and the two lines are not nearly parallel. We could say that portion of lot 10 lines southerly of a line connecting a point on the east line of said lot distant northerly along said east line 75.00 feet from the southeast corner of said lot with a point on the west line of said lot distant along said west line northerly 75.00 feet from the southwest corner of said lot. Or we could write a meets and bounds description beginning at either of the two southerly lot corners and running in either direction around the parcel using general directions and calls along the lot lines where appropriate. It would also cite the two 75-foot dimensions where they apply. The third description. This conveyance would include whatever is left. It would read like this, lot 10 of whatever, except the north 75.00 feet of said lot. Also accepting that portion thereof described as follows. Here you would repeat what was said in the second deed. Number three, the first description gets the dividing, gets to set the dividing line and the other deed will describe what was left. This is how it might sound. First one would read, the east 4.15 acres of lot three of whatever. The second would read, lot three of etc. except the east 4.15 acres thereof. The west line of the 4.15 acres would be set parallel with the east line of the lot because that line is nearly cardinal in direction. The location of the east line of the west half of this lot would be unclear because the west line of the lot is not nearly in a cardinal direction. Number four. Note that this lot is somewhat near square and the opposite sides look parallel. It's the southeasterly two acres that need to be described. Note also that the problem is only worth two points. An inexperienced writer could easily spend much more time on this one than the two points are worth. We'll have to be a bit creative with this one. Note that the opposite sides of the two acre parcel seem to be parallel and all four sides seem to be about the same length. Perhaps we can use those facts in composing a description. The southeasterly 2.0 acres of lot 13 of the southerly and easterly side lines of said two acre parcel being of equal length and the northerly and westerly side lines being parallel with the southerly and easterly lines respectively of said lot. The remainder of the lot would be described as lot 13 of etc except, and then describe the two acre parcel. 1986 exam, problem A3. The problem described an approved tentative parcel map with the final parcel map waived. In other words, we can forget about the parcel map. The problem is to write four separate descriptions in such a way that they are compatible with one another. One is for a proposed county road which is to be recorded first and the other three are for three proposed parcels that are to abut upon the road. The problem further states that the bearings and dimensions shown are either record or calculated from record and do not come from a survey. 
The descriptions are to be written in such a way that if a later survey found the bearings and dimensions to be different, the descriptions would still fit neatly together. Let's supply the seven questions from the planning the task section to the description required for the road easement, since that one has to be recorded first. What kind of description is best? Number one. The road easement is a strip of land of uniform width using a dimension center line. The obvious choice is to use a strip description. Number two, what kind for the adjoining parcels? All of the three other descriptions will abut upon the road. In fact, since the road is an easement, the center line of the road will be the property line between parcel three on one side and parcels one and two on the other. Since the road easement will be recorded first, any number of types of description could be used for the other three. Number three, what point is best for the point of beginning? It could start at the point where the center line intersects the north line or the south line of existing lot 18. Whichever point is chosen, it should be referenced to one of the lot corners. If the description begins at the south line, your description will have to begin with a curve. Note that the radial bearing is given there. It might be easier to begin at the point on the north line of the lot. Number four, where should the basis of bearings be established? Here's an easy place to make a mistake by failing to properly establish a basis of bearings. It should normally be established in the first course. We might say, beginning at a point on the north line of said lot 18, distant along said line, north 89 degrees east, 240.00 feet, from the northwest corner of said lot 18. Failing to give the bearing along the north line would be a mistake. Number five, clockwise or counterclockwise? This question really does not apply in this case. Number six, what call should be made? The basis of bearings should call along whichever lot line is used and at the end of the description, the call must be made to the other lot line. What clauses should be added? A clause should be added explaining how and where the sidelines of the strip are to terminate. The clause is needed here because the described line terminates at the lot line, and some might assume that the sideline should terminate at a line at right angles or radially to the center line, passing through the point of termination. There we have it. The preamble would not mention the parcel map because it does not exist. The parcel would be described as a portion of lot 18, track 400, etc. Now for parcel one. Question number one, what description, what kind of description is best? Most people would choose a meets and bounds description, so let's use that. A line description could be used as well, calling for that portion of said lot 18 lying westerly of the previously recorded road easement and northerly of the following described line. And then follow with a description of the common line between parcels one and two. Question two, what kind for the adjoining parcel? This is an important question for this parcel because the line between it and parcel two must fall in the same location from each of the descriptions, even if a later survey showed that the bearings and dimensions we are using are wrong. The only way to make sure that the south line of parcel one will be in the same place as the north line of parcel two is to use the same identical language in each description. We should use a meets and bounds description for parcel two as well, but the point of beginning, the basis of bearings, and the description of the common line must be identical in each description. Number three, point of beginning. The point of beginning should be the west end of the common line reference to one of the lot corners. Let's call it a point on the common line, <coughs> excuse me, let's call it a point on the west line of said lot 18, distant along said line, 
north one degree west, 150.00 feet from the southwest corner of lot 18. Number four, basis of bearings. The basis of bearings should be the west line of lot 18 and should include a call along the line as well as a bearing and distance. Number five, <coughs> clockwise or counterclockwise? counterclockwise, so that the free line call, the common line, is described first. Number six, what calls should be made? Two and along the center line of the road easement, two and along the north line of the lot, and two and along the west line back to the point of beginning. Number seven, what clauses need to be added? None. Parcel two. We've already shown that the same identical language should be used here for the point of beginning, the basis of bearings, and the description of the common line. Therefore, this one much must read in a clockwise direction, and calls made to and along the center line of the road easement, and then to and along the south and west lines of the lot back to the point of beginning. If line descriptions were decided on for parcels one and two, the common line would be described in the same way, tying it to a point on the west line of lot 18, distant the same bearing and distance from the same lot corner in each case. Then the description for parcel 1 would read, that portion of lot 18, etc., line westerly of the road and line northerly of the following described line. The one for parcel 2 would read the same, except for the fact that it would read southerly of the following described line instead of northerly. Parcel 3. This one could be a line description calling for that portion of lot 18 lying easterly of the road, or it could be a meets and bounds description beginning at one of the lot corners and re reading in either direction with calls to and along all the lot lines and the road. 1991 exam, problem B1. Here's another good test for our list of seven questions. It is also an occasion to use the miscellaneous clauses you have in your workbook. Using standard language to describe some of the tricky situations we face will make your work much easier. Let's go through the questions. Number one, what kind of description is best? That question has really been decided for us in this case. It will have to be a descript description. Remember, however, that there are a number of ways of describing a strip of land, as you will see in miscellaneous clauses section of your workbook. It would be helpful to quickly review the possibilities before writing. For instance, the center line of the strip can be described, but that would necessitate a call to a parallel line towards the end of the description. It is also possible to use a sideline description using the right-hand sideline of the strip looking in the direction of the traverse. That would eliminate the need to call to a parallel line. However, you will find a sample of a call to a parallel line in your workbook. So let's use the center line. Some of the data needs to be calculated, of course. Number two, what kind for adjoining parcels? We're not required to write any of the adjoining descriptions, but if and when they were written, they would certainly be strip descriptions as well. Number three, what point is best for the point of beginning? The problem requires that we begin the description at the southwest corner of section five, so that much is decided for us. However, the actual conveyance begins east of there where the strip intersects the south line of the section. So let's use the section corner as the point of commencement and the point where the conveyance begins as the true point of beginning. Here's how the preamble and the first course might be written. That portion of the southwest quarter of section five, township seven north, range 12 east, Mount Diablo Meridian, according to official plat thereof, consisting of a strip of land 40.00 feet wide line 20.00 feet on each side of the following described line. Commencing at the southwest corner of said section five, 
thence east 441.00 feet along the south line of said section to the true point of beginning. The next course may be a challenge for some because it requires describing a non-tangent curve to start the strip description. That can be a bit intimidating for in inexperienced writers, but remember, it's in the book. Once again, your workbook has samples of how this is done. Find a sample that seems to fit the situation and adapt it to fit. Number four, where should the basis of bearings be established? The basis of bearings was established when we called along the section line and gave a bearing as well. Number five, clockwise or counterclockwise? This question really applies only in meets and bounds descriptions. Number six, what call should be made? The southwest corner of the section, the south line of the section, the south line of parcel A of the parcel map, and the west line of the section. The call to the south line of parcel A of the parcel map must result in the strip abutting upon the south line of parcel A. Number seven, what clauses need to be added? We'll need to add a clause to make sure that the sidelines of the strip begin and end where we want them to. Again, there are samples in the workbook. It might sound like this. The sidelines of said strip at the beginning of said description shall be continued or shortened so as, as necessary so as to begin at the south line of said section and at the end of said description said sidelines shall be prolonged or shortened as necessary so as to terminate at the west line of said section. Note that we use the term continued at the beginning of the strip and the word prolonged at the end. This is because curved lines are continued and straight lines are prolonged. Well, there you have it. The planning the task exercise should help you think through the major problems you'll encounter before you start to write. Not all of the questions will apply in every case, but it's good to get in the habit of going through the checklist every time. Also, remember again to get acquainted with as many standard, acceptable, tested ways of saying certain things as you can. You'll find a number of them in your workbook and you'll find others in other places. Don't try to memorize them but index them and learn how to find the ones you need in a hurry. Study the techniques and principles we've talked about and practice writing legal descriptions. Practice particularly how to find samples quickly and be able to use them. Now, as the saying goes, that's all, folks. The rest is up to you. Good luck with your test.